Tony Hamilton visited a Christian school to discuss enrolling his son. He also mentioned Big Mike, a homeless boy who occasionally stayed with him. Coach Cotton was impressed by Michael's physical stats, but the principal was skeptical, unsure what to do with a boy who had an IQ of 80 and a GPA close to zero. They didn't even know his exact age. Seeing the resistance from the school board, the coach reminded them that they were a Christian school and should help all children. Big Mike, in tattered sneakers and worn clothes, attended his new school for the first time. Miss Boswell handed out test sheets to assess the students' knowledge, but Michael didn't attempt to answer a single question. He just drew a little boat. Tony's wife was frustrated with Michael constantly staying over and eating all their food. She was determined to put an end to it. Lee and Tui attended a school volleyball match to support her daughter, Collins, along with her family. Her husband, Sean, noticed the big African-American boy cleaning up leftover popcorn after the game. A month passed, and Michael still hadn't completed a single assignment. On the playground, young SJ Tui befriended him and talked about his father, a former basketball star. Lee and first noticed the big, humble guy and decided to talk to the principal about him. Recently, newspapers had reported about a homeless man who fell off an overpass and died. It turned out to be Michael's father. Michael couldn't even remember the last time he saw him. Michael went to the laundromat to wash his only spare shirt and opened the textbook Mrs. Boswell had given him. He earned a satisfactory grade on his next test. Mrs. Boswell believed he wasn't unintelligent, but needed a different approach to learning. One evening, the Tui family was driving home from school when they saw Michael standing in the rain in his usual clothes. He was heading to the school gym for warmth, but it was already closed. Realizing he had nowhere to stay, Lee and put him in the car and brought him home. Collins was surprised to see the big guy on their doorstep. For Michael, it was his first time in such a large, luxurious house. That night, the Tui couple wondered if they had made the right decision and worried if he might steal from them. The next morning, when Lee and went downstairs, she saw that the bed linens were neatly folded, but Michael was gone. She managed to catch him just in time and invited him to celebrate Thanksgiving with them. While everyone was watching the Super Bowl, Lee and prepared a feast. Everyone quickly piled food onto their plates and returned to watching football, except for Michael, who tucked a roll into his pocket and sat at the dining table. Lee and paused, turned off the televisions, and made her family eat at the table as well. They all held hands to say a prayer, a new experience for Big Mike. The next day, Lee and took Michael to a store to buy new clothes, as his spare shirt in a bag didn't qualify as a proper wardrobe. However, Michael claimed he had clothes. They drove to the ghetto, the neighborhood where Michael grew up and where his mother lived. He had left some of his belongings there. Michael insisted that Lee and stay in the car. A local figure greeted Mike, but he only acknowledged one person, David, likely his brother. At his home, Michael found an eviction notice on the door. Unsure of his mother's whereabouts, he returned to the car and lied, saying she had just moved. They then visited a local store for big and tall clothing. The selection was mediocre, so Lee and let Michael choose what he liked. He turned out to love brightly striped clothes. Lee and also considered setting up a bedroom for Michael with sturdy furniture since he had already broken their $10,000 couch. At school, Michael underwent a vocational aptitude test. The results showed that his learning ability was only 5%, but he scored an impressive 98% in the protective instincts category. Lee and presented Michael with his new room. He was incredibly grateful, as he had never had his own bed before. To hide her tears, a moved Lee and retreated to another room. Today was a special day. The family planned to celebrate Michael's improved grades at a fancy restaurant, which now made him eligible for the football tryouts. At the restaurant, Michael recognized one of the workers and gave him a tight hug. This was Marcus, his brother, though Michael didn't know where he lived. The last time he saw him, Michael was just a small child. For the first time in his life, 17-year-old Michael had a bedtime story read to him. Leanne confessed that by taking Michael in, she not only improved his life, but also made her own happier. The following Christmas, the Tui family took a holiday photo together, now including Michael. Some relatives had questions, though. Leanne's wealthy friends called Michael King Kong and attributed her kind act to white guilt. They also questioned whether her daughter felt safe living under the same roof as a big African-American guy. Lee and shamed her friends and left. She discovered that people at school also spoke poorly about Michael. Over time, Collins' attitude towards the gentle giant improved. She demonstratively left her friends in the library to sit with Michael. Michael attended his first football practice, but there was one problem. He knew nothing about the sport and did everything wrong. He was more fascinated by the balloons floating into the sky than by the game itself. Unlike other foster children who channeled their anger on the field, Michael was a gentle giant who wouldn't hurt a fly. SJ personally took charge of training him. 
Since everyone in the Tui family was an athlete, Michael began to train hard to avoid disappointing them. One evening, Michael asked Lee and for help in getting a driver's license. It wasn't that he was eager to drive. He just wanted to have at least one document with his name on it. It turned out that there were no records of a person named Michael O'Hare in the system, and that might not even be his real last name. This prompted Lee and to consider becoming Michael's legal guardian. Social services revealed that when Michael was seven, he was separated from his mother and his numerous siblings. His drug-addicted mother had at least 12 children. Since Michael was under state guardianship, her consent for legal guardianship wasn't necessary. However, Lee and felt it was wrong to proceed without it and decided to meet Michael's mother. The woman cried upon learning that her selfless visitor had taken full responsibility for her son. She initially claimed Michael's last name was Proctor, but then admitted she guessed it as she couldn't remember his father's name. Michael's actual surname was Williams. During a family meeting, Sean asked Michael if he minded them becoming his legal guardians, to which Michael, surprised, asked if they weren't already a family. Michael finally got his driver's license and a pickup truck as a gift. SJ taught Michael football tactics using spice jars. The boy tricked his mom, so Michael would take him to the store to buy a new video game. The friends had fun, but the inexperienced driver frequently got distracted, failing to notice an oncoming truck, leading to a collision. A distressed Michael sat on the curb, while SJ only had a split lip. The police officer explained to Lee, and that children shouldn't sit in the front seat because airbags deploy with such force that they can break a child's facial bones. However, SJ was barely hurt because Michael had instinctively put his arm out to block the airbag. SJ recorded Michael's training sessions to analyze his mistakes later. Michael struggled, and the coach couldn't effectively communicate what he wanted from him. Lee and intervened, telling Michael that the team was his family, and he needed to protect them just as he protected SJ from the airbag. This transformed Michael, and he started taking down opponents on the field. It was time to test Michael's skills against another school team. The opponents immediately started taunting the big guy, including a nasty old redneck who sat near the Tui family. Unfortunately, Michael struggled against a quick, trash-talking opponent who turned out to be the son of the rude old man. The quick opponent managed to evade Michael repeatedly. Lee and tried to influence the game again, even calling the coach on his cell phone. Frustrated, she eventually lashed out at the racist old man. When Michael was down, the player with jersey number 66 kicked him in the helmet, but the referee ignored the foul. The coach then declared he would protect Michael like his own son. Michael remembered Leanne's words about the team being his family, and, regaining his focus, he tackled number 66 with incredible force, dragging him across the field until they reached the end. This was the turning point in the game. Michael continued to block his opponents successfully, leading his team to a landslide victory. SJ recorded the best moments of the match and sent the footage to college teams across America. Every coach who saw it was impressed by Michael's prowess. They all came to the school to see the phenomenon in person. A man in a yellow cap from the University of Tennessee arrived. Lee and despised their team and immediately told Coach Cotton to reject him. Michael was pitted against another player and effortlessly knocked him down. The coaches quickly reached for their phones, indicating Michael's promising sports future. However, it was revealed that Michael needed a minimum GPA of 2.5 to qualify for college, meaning he had to score at least a B on all remaining assignments. Consequently, they decided to hire a tutor for him. Miss Sue assured Michael that she would help him as long as he believed in himself. One day, a college coach visited the Tui family, who welcomed him warmly. They had no idea that soon they would be hosting such visitors daily, each trying to recruit Michael to their college. The constant meetings tired Michael, who still had to study hard. The season ended with Michael leading his team to a private school championship. Leanne dreamed of Michael attending Ole Miss, so she advised the coach on how to win him over. However, Michael leaned towards choosing Tennessee, which Leanne despised. She convinced Miss Sue to tell Michael that the FBI stored decomposing bodies under Tennessee's football fields. This spooked the impressionable Michael, leading him to choose Ole Miss. At graduation, Lee and informed her husband that Michael achieved the necessary 2.5 GPA, allowing him to enroll in his chosen college. But another challenge awaited him. A representative from the NCAA summoned Michael for questioning. She pointed out that after Michael signed with Ole Miss, Coach Cotton received a job there. Additionally, Michael's guardian, Sean, played basketball at Ole Miss, Lee and was a cheerleader there, and even Miss Sue attended the same college. The representative suggested that the Tuies were essentially recruiters, and their actions could set a precedent where recruiters become guardians of underprivileged athletes to follow them into specific universities. She implied that everything the Tuies did for Michael was to ensure he played football for Ole Miss. Troubled by this, Michael ran away, feeling betrayed and distrustful of Leanne. Michael didn't return home that night, 
leaving Li and to reflect on whether she had pushed him too hard, prioritizing her desires over his needs. Big Mike ventured into the ghetto to meet his mother. A local tough lured him into a hideout, claiming his mother needed to pick up a fix. His brother David dropped out of school and joined a gang. The thug began hurling crude remarks at Lee and and her daughter. Mike considered leaving, but the tough threatened him with a gun. Unfazed, Mike scattered the thugs, giving them a beating and breaking furniture over them. Memories of being taken from his family at seven resurfaced. He no longer wanted this life. Lee and arrived in the neighborhood to find out if Mike was there. The tough threatened her and her foster son, but Lee Ann, a Republican and member of the shooting association, always carried a pistol in her purse, intimidating the thug. Mike called, calling Lee and his mother and asking her to pick him up from the laundromat. Only then did she ask if Mike even wanted to play football. And if he liked Tennessee, he could choose that college. It was his decision. Nonetheless, Mike chose Ole Miss because his entire family had attended, wanting to be closer to them. Miss Sue continued to help him with his studies here. It was just important that he didn't get too distracted by coeds. Lee and cried again and hid in the car, but Mike asked her to come out and hugged her tightly. Lee and once read an article about a talented 21-year-old athlete who grew up without parents and was killed in a gang fight. Then she reassured herself that she had done everything right because that could have been her son Mike. Mike or became the star player at Ole Miss and, with Miss Sue's support, earned an academic degree. After college, Mike began his professional football career.